about that, we're going to talk about the United States and Bible prophecy. Before we do, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study Bible prophecy. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us in a very manifest way, that you would speak to hearts and minds, that they would be open and receptive to you and your Son, Jesus, for in his name we pray, amen. Amen. You may remember the story of the Continental Congress back in 1776, and the history goes that a man by the name of Caesar Rodney was one of the three delegates from the Delaware delegation. And as they were voting on whether to separate from Mother England, of these three, these three delegates, sorry, I saw a bug hitting a man in the head. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, got my mind off. So, uh, of these three delegates, one of them had voted to, to separate from Mother England, and the other one had decided to stay. And so, there was one person left in this deadlock, and the one that would break that deadlock would be Caesar Rodney. The trouble was, he was at home with face cancer at the time. And so here he was trying to decide whether to go, and, but he knew, I have to make a decision because one of them's gone one way and one's the other. I need, to, I need to make it help finalize this decision. So he was marooned at home with this terrible storm. But he got on his horse and he rode 70 miles through the rain to make it, to actually go forth and to sign his name on the Declaration of Independence. He decided to vote to separate from Mother England. And the story goes, some, now that story is sh- true. Sometimes this, the next portion, you don't know, is this a little bit of a, a little fiction added in to the, to the beginning of a nation? I don't know, but the story goes like this, that there was a little boy who was the grandson of the bell ringer in town. And he had gone over and he had told his grandson, son, go and watch to see if they sign the Declaration of Independence. If they do, run back and bring word to me so that I can ring the bell to let everyone know that we have signed a declaration to become independent from Mother England. And so the little boy, story goes that he was watching and he was able to stand from afar and he saw the men get up and he saw the quill taken and the men signing the Declaration of the Independence. And as he saw that, he ran back to grandfather and he said, Grandpa, Grandpa, ring the bell, ring the bell, ring the bell for liberty. You know, one of the greatest desires for every human being is to be what? free. It is one of the greatest desires, and at least in the Constitution, it wasn't always dealt out to everyone, sadly, but at least that concept was there. And because of that, we slowly came to a freedom for everyone. And looking at this, the First Amendment of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The First Amendment, we, a part of the First Amendment anyway, is that the government will not have a forced religion. Now, I have lived in different countries, and in two of the countries I've lived in, they had what's called the state church. You're actually born a part of a certain religion, no matter what religion your family comes from. It's a state church. And so this, but this was historically common in many nations around the world, especially Europe. Obviously, you know, in the history of many nations, you kind of were whatever the king was. That's what you were to follow, maybe at the pain of death. But this idea of having freedom and religious freedom was put forth in the United States. And the thing is, is that God gave humanity freedom of choice. God gave us this thinking of Jesus himself. Did you ever see Jesus force anybody to follow him? You remember the rich young ruler. He told him, 
There's a wealthy young man. He said, sell all that you have and follow me. Did the young man decide to do that? No, it said he went away sorrowful. But Jesus did not force him. Jesus gives freedom of what? He gives freedom of choice. And this is going to be the issue at the end of time. There's going to be an issue where we begin to lose our freedoms. But you see all the way back in Joshua chapter 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. Notice this is an issue. God even gave his people in the Old Testament the choice, choose you this day whom you will serve. We're going to discover that Revelation's final issues revolve around the issue of worship and freedom of conscience. And even at the very end of the Bible, the last chapter, we see in Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will or whosoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Notice the Bible says, whoever wills, if it's your will, then you can take of the water of life. Jesus will give it to you. But you have to have that will. You have to have that desire. And it is up to you. Jesus will not force anyone to be in heaven. He won't force anybody. He gives us freedom of choice. Now, we are going to do something we haven't done yet. We're going to read an entire chapter through. Revelation chapter 13. We're looking at the United States and Bible prophecy. And if you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. The first part we've already studied, the first beast that rises up out of the sea... We've already discovered who this power is. We've studied this. We've seen it night after night. Uh, The Bible's crystal clear, and we're going to talk about that. We see in Revelation chapter 13, the reason we're going all the way through the chapter is because there's two great powers in this chapter. There's really kind of three, but it's mainly talking about two powers here. And we're going to see the first power, and then that first power begins to lose its power, And then another power arises as it is losing its power. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now, we've already seen a sea represents an area of a multitude of people. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast, which is a nation, rise up out of the sea, out of an area of a multitude of people, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of what? blasphemy so here is a kingdom that speaks blasphemy we've already talked about what blasphemy is we know who this power is and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet was as the, were as the feet of a bear and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion and the dragon which is satan gave him his power and his seat and his great authority these different beasts here the lion, the leopard, and the bear, these were found in Daniel chapter 7 in the chapter of the Antichrist, right? We've already seen that. And that's what this is referring to here, that same power. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it were, what? Wounded to death. This power would rule, we see, for 1,260 years. This power that would persecute. It says... It says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. He was going to lose his power. And his deadly wound was what? Healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which is Satan, which gave power unto this beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying unto him, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months, or 1,260 days, which was 1,260 prophetic years. As, as the papal power was able to come to power in 538 A.D. by kicking the Ostrogoths out of Rome, the Bible says they would rule for 1,260 years, and until... You may remember Napoleon comes in to the Vatican, takes the Pope off the throne, takes him off into exile. He ends up dying later on in France, in Valence, in France, uh, later on after that time period. We've talked about that. But this power would rule for 1,260 years. It says in verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, 
and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So notice this is an issue of worship, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Now notice this next key point here. He that leadeth into captivity, this power for years had been persecuting and killing faithful Christians who would study their Bibles. And so it says in verse 10, he that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He's been leading into captivity. Now he's going to go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So as this power is beginning to lose its power, remember that took place when Napoleon sent Berthier. This was in, does anybody remember the year? 1798. 1798. And so he loses his power in 1798. And what we're going to see is now another power right around 1798 comes up. A new power begins to rise upon planet Earth. And it says, we'll read verse 12, and he, it says in verse 11, rather, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So notice, this next beast, the first beast came up out of what? Do you remember the first beast came up? Out of the sea. It came up out of the water, which waters represent a multitude of people. This next beast comes up out of the earth, and so if the sea represents a multitude of, and by the way, we still use that terminology today, that sea, that using the term sea to represent people. People might say something, they go to a giant stadium, and they might say there was a sea of people there. Does that make sense? You know exactly what they meant. We still use some of the terminology that was used even in prophecy. And so this happens that the, a sea represents a multitude of people, so the opposite of the sea would be the earth, so you would expect that to be the opposite of a multitude of people, a relatively desolate area. But we're going to come back to that. It says in verse 12, oh, actually, let's go back to verse 11. I beheld another beast, another kingdom, another nation, rather, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So this is a nation that comes up with two horns like a lamb. What does a lamb generally represent in the Bible? It represents Jesus. But notice it says this nation kind of looks lamb-like. It looks Christ-like, but it ends up speaking like a what? Dragon. A dragon. Who's, who's a dragon? Satan. This is Satan. So here's a nation that initially espouses Christian principles, but then it ends up speaking like the devil. Has this nation done evil things in its past? Yes or no? Yes, yes. but we're going to get to that in just a moment. All nations have, really, but we're going to talk about this. It says in verse 12, And he, this power, so notice this power comes up around 1798. It says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this power that reigned for the Vatican City, who'd reigned for many of these years, that this next nation is going to point the world back to that power. It says, verse 12, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And how's he going to get his power? Verse 13, And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So he's going to have miracles taking place. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be Killed. Now, here's what many people think about when they think of Revelation, this next three verses. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six, or six hundred and sixty-six. So 
we are going to break down, notice this power loses its power in 1798, and another nation comes up looking like a Christ-like nation that becomes a worldwide power, but ends up speaking like the dragon. So three questions we're going to touch on. Number one, when this power arises. Number two, where this power arises. And number three, how this power arises. Well, let's begin. Where does this power arise? I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So it comes up out of a, the opposite of water. So if water is a multitude of people, this one comes up in a relatively desolate area. And it says, and he had two horns like a lamb. So it rises up looking Christ-like, like we said. But another key component is, there's no crowns on this beast. The first beast has horns and crowns. And crown represents something like a monarchical type government or a government based upon a king or these kind of leaders. So this new nation comes up that doesn't seem to be a monarchy, a nation without a king. Now that's unusual. So let's go forward. This, we already saw the second beast, the earth beast, will arise somewhere around 1798. As the papacy is losing its power, another nation would begin to rise up in an, a relatively unpopulated area. Number three, it would have no crowned head, no kingly authority. And the text says it would have power over the whole earth. It would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence, and it would be espousing a lamb-like or a Christ-like character, but then it would end up speaking like a dragon. But what is the only nation that rose up around 1798 in a relatively unpopulated area with no king, a nation without a king, this was unusual, and became a worldwide superpower? You said it. The only nation that fulfills this is the United States of America. There is no other worldwide power that rose up around 1798. Now, there are a few superpowers today. Uh, China, would you say China's quite powerful? Yeah, I think everybody would agree. That. Did China rise up around 1798? China's been around for millennia. Yes or no? Yes, it has. So China couldn't be that power. Uh, you know, Rome, uh, not Rome, Russia obviously is relatively strong, but I mean, you know, not compared to China or the United States at this point, obviously, uh, but they do have like 5,000 nuclear bombs, so they do have, they do have some power that they, they are a force to be reckoned with, but did they rise up around 1798, yes or no? No, they've also been around for centuries, so it's not them either, but the only one that represents this, a superpower that rose up around 1798, is the United States of America. So let's just go around this first of all. Did it rise around 1798? Yes, the Declaration of Independence was July, anybody remember the day? July 4th, we call that Independence Day, right? 1776, right? That was our independence from Mother Britain. And did the United States come up in a relatively unpopulated area compared to Europe. Yeah. Yes, yes, there were some people, nomadic people here and some people who are more stationary, but compared with Europe, it was relatively unpopulated. Number three, this was a nation with no crowned head, no kingly authority, yes or no? We didn't have a king. We don't have a king. And I hope we never do have a king. Amen? <laughs> Um, number four, it would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence. Is that true of the United States? Yes. yes, without a doubt. Nobody would disagree with that. And did the United States at least espouse or claim Christ-like principles, yes or no? Yes. But did they always live up to it? Obviously not, right? But at least that was in the you know, constitution, like we said, that uh, not forcing people to have religion like we talked about already here. And we already talked about the fact that Jesus never forced anybody to follow him. So that's a Christ-like principle right there, giving people the freedom of choice, even in areas of religion. I appreciate that. And some of the fundamental principles of the United States are civil liberty, which is freedom from a king, and number two, religious liberty, which is, to be honest, freedom from a pope, that nobody would be forced to follow the dictates of any human being. 
And George Washington said it best when he said in 1789, every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own good conscience. Do you agree with that? I fully agree with that. Benjamin Franklin, he also said it very well. I like this. He said, when religion is good, it will take care of itself. When it is not able to take care of itself, and God does not see fit to take care of it, so that it has to appeal to the civil power for support, it's evidence, in my mind, that the cause is a bad one. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, if, if your religion is not working very well, and so you have to turn to the government and tell the government, hey, force people to follow my religion. He said that's evidence in Benjamin Franklin's mind anyway that your religion is a bad one. That, that's, that's his idea. You may agree, disagree, but that was his thought, and I, I happen to agree with that. So how does a nation speak and cause people to do things? Uh, now, for instance, taxes. Now, Jesus tells us, you know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. But do most people do it because they just, out of the abundance of your heart, you just think like, man, I just want to give the government 25% of everything I make. <laughs> just, just gives me a, just like tingles in my heart just to give that 25% to the man. I appreciate that, right? And I just want them to have that. Probably not, right? You do it because... You don't want to get in trouble, right? Most people do it because it's kind of like supposed to be the law, right? And so you do it for that reason. And so how do nations cause people to do things? Well, they obviously do it through their laws and legislative body. Simple, right? That's how they force people to do things. And Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 says, we read it already, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake, as a dragon. How do nations speak? By forcing people to do things. And then it says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast, that one that ruled for 1,260 years, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes, I mean, he forces the earth and them which dwell in the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, the Bible here is predicting an erosion of our freedoms when church and state unite. You say, Chad, but the, the Constitution says that we're not going to have a state-sponsored church. But the Bible says that there's going to be an erosion of our freedoms when church and state, when forced religion, forced worship will take place. So the question is, how does this power gain its following? Look there, if you're still in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, we're going to look in verse 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. And it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those what? Those signs or miracles. The King James says miracles, or the New Translation says signs which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So what is taking place here? It says that it's going to gain a following by working miracles. There are, according to the Bible, going to be miracles at the end of time. And many people think, well, if you see a miracle, that would be from God. Uh, you may even have heard an atheist say, I would believe in God if there were a miracle. If I could just see a miracle, then I'd know that there was, there would be, that there's a God. The trouble is there are going to be miracles, but they don't always come from, you see that. So what if you made a rule like that and the devil says, okay, I'll give you a miracle. And then you end up following the wrong one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because can God work miracles, yes or no? Yes, he can. Can the devil work miracles? Yes, he can. So a miracle is not proof that God is with a person or a nation. Do you follow? So that's not proof. We need something better than miracles. We need the Word of God. 
we need to stand upon the word of God. If God is with someone, their, their message will stand with Jesus and you will know them by their fruits. They will living, be living out what God's word says. So could it be that a return to God coerced by religious legislation will be seen as the answer to waning moral values, economic collapse, and natural disasters. Do we seem like we're going through any of these events right now? <laughs> like waning moral values, economic collapse, and natural disasters? And sure, hopefully, other than the stock market just had its like biggest day in history today, as far as probably points-wise, it just exploded. But regardless, that doesn't mean it's going to continue that way, right? And it may, hey, maybe the stock market will stay up for a time, and, and I hope the economy doesn't crash anytime soon. But the reality is at some point, the economy will struggle more because we see the Bible says that there comes a time in Revelation where it says that money comes to naught or riches come to naught, right? So could it be that as financial troubles, natural disasters, moral difficulties, or moral, waning moral values, that, that the country finally says, we've got to do something, we've got to do something, we've got to get back to God. But then they point people not to, the, not to the true aspects of the Bible, but to the traditions of men instead. And they force men to follow not God's word, but the traditions of men. So here's looking in Newsweek, and this, this article titled, Religious Freedom is Under Attack Like Never Before. Could we see things like that happening in the United States that was to be a nation of freedom even freedom of religion. Could that happen? Well, we already saw that the, the second beast, which is the United States, points the people of the world to the first beast, which is Rome, the, you know, the Vatican, right? This is going to happen, the Bible actually says. And so the issues at the end of time we're going to discover are, number one, worshiping the beast. It talks repeatedly about worshiping the beast. This is not a secular issue. And or on the converse of it, you will either be worshiping the beast at the end of time or you will worship the creator. One or the other. There's, there's really not a third choice. And so I want to touch on, because we saw at the end of this chapter, there's something called the mark of the what? The beast. The beast. Now, there's something called the mark of the beast, but there's the opposite is called, uh, anybody know what the opposite of the mark of the beast is? the seal of God. And if you receive the seal of God, you cannot receive the mark of the beast. Does that make sense? So do you want the seal of God? I sure do. Because if you receive the seal, you can't receive the mark. And so I don't want the mark, and I'm, I trust you all don't either. And so what we see with the mark of the beast is as things get difficult and, and they will try to unite the world under this mark of the beast, we're going to kind of do an overview of it tonight. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is. By the way, there is going to be a study coming up. I'm going to tell you more about it at the end of the message. But we're going to start studies on Sunday evening, this Sunday, and then once a week, Sunday evenings. And we're going to go deeper into these things so we, you can understand more of this, but it's just going to become a weekly thing. Uh, but you're going to find out what the actual mark of the beast is. Tonight we're doing an overview, a, uh, just like a wetting your whistle for what it is. But we're going to study a little bit of the seal quickly and talk about the mark. But you're going to find out exactly what it is in this Bible study. Not, not Sunday, but coming up uh, as the studies continue. But let's look at the seal of God first. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 3 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, neither on the sea nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And it says, And he cried, this angel cried with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? Foreheads. So where is the seal of God going to be? In the forehead. Where did it say in Revelation 13, we read it already, 
where is the mark of the beast going to be given? In the hand or in the forehead. Either one, right? So it's two different things. The mark of the beast will be in the hand or in the forehead, but the seal of God is only where? In the forehead. Very, very interesting. So we're going to look at this. Now, we need to understand a bit of what the Bible says about the forehead and the hand. And where do the symbols in the book of Revelation come from? They come from the Old Testament. So if we want to learn about something that was put on the hand and on the forehead, just guess where you might want to go look for it. You go look in the Old Testament and see what they were told back then that would give us an indication of what would happen at the end of time. Now, what was the hand a symbol for in Old Testament times? We're looking in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. It says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So notice it says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. The hands in the Bible are a symbol of strength. They're also a symbol of your actions, the things you do. So that's a symbol of what you do, the hand. And then what about the forehead? Notice what the Bible says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your what? Hearts. Now, the heart and mind are synonymous in Bible times because the Bible also says, as a man thinketh in his what? Heart, so is he. That's Proverbs 23, verse 7. But notice it says, these commandments, speaking of the Ten Commandments, they were just spoken of in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts. Impress them upon your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road when you lie down and when you get up tie them these are the ten commandments tie them as symbols on your what hands and bind them on your what foreheads did they have something symbolically on the hand and forehead in the old testament yes or no what was it it was the ten commandments the Ten Commandments were put on the hand, bind them, it says it right there, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. This is where we get this symbol in the book of Revelation. Now, looking at this, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes people think the Holy Spirit, some people have said, oh, the Holy Spirit is just like electricity or something. Now, if a parent has a child turn away and fall into sin, we would say that that grieves the parent. That grieves, it causes the parent emotional pain. Now, notice it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, meaning the Holy Spirit is not electricity. It is a being. He has emotions. He is hurt when you turn away from what the Holy Spirit tries to impress you to do. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So according to this, who does the sealing upon the human beings? It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 2 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the down payment of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, notice the Holy Spirit's the one who seals us. Here it says He seals us in our hearts, but we're going to see that two things, the Holy Spirit does something not only in our hearts, but also in our minds. We're going to see that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 and 16 says, whereof the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, who's the he? The Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit say? This is the covenant, this is the new covenant actually, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and into their 
minds will I write them. So notice the Holy Spirit is going to write the law in the heart, but he's also going to write the law in our minds. In the Old Testament, it talked about that law being on the hand and on the forehead. Who does the actual sealing? It is the, it is the Holy Spirit. So we've already talked about the fact that when we haven't given our life to Jesus and we love sin, that's normal. We were born loving sin. Yes or no? Yes. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Because as you're born again, God writes his law in your heart and in your mind. And as we've talked about, thus changing your love from the love of the world to beginning, you get to the point like it said about Jesus, he delighted to do God's law because God's law was in his heart. So as the Holy Spirit writes in your mind and in your heart, he changes you into a different person. You're born again. And you get to the point where you begin to delight to do God's will. And interestingly, so the Holy Spirit is going to write the law in our minds. And we don't have to guess what the seal of God is. We don't have to guess. Because remember, these symbols, like the seal, comes from the Old Testament. We've already seen what God had them put on the hand and on the forehead in the Old Testament. It was the Ten Commandments. So what is the seal of God? The Old Testament tells us 100% clearly. It says in Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony. Seal the what? Law, Law among my disciples. What is God's seal? It's his law. This is not confusing at all. We can know with 100% clarity that God's law is the seal of God. Very clear. This symbol comes from the Old Testament, and then we see the one who actually does the sealing is the Holy Spirit. He writes his law in our hearts. He writes it in our minds. He seals us, Ephesians tells us. And so we're going to be sealed in our minds and in our hearts with that hope by the Holy Spirit writing the law in our minds and in our hearts. Looking at this, do you think the Ten Commandments that he writes in our minds and in our hearts is going to be the actual Ten Commandments or one that has been changed by man? The actual one. The actual one. Now that begins to give you just an inclination of where this is going to go at the mark of the beast. If the seal of, the God is, seal of God is God writing his law in our minds and in our hearts, as it says, bind up the testimony, seal the law amongst my disciples. That's very clear. Then what is the mark of the beast? As you go forward in these studies that will be coming up week after week, you will see 100% clearly from the word of God what the mark of the beast is. That's going to be a Sunday night Bible study, but... Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he speaks as a dragon. Well, what do we see about speaking in the words of Jesus? Jesus said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart. And we see that as our nation gets further and further away from God, the United States is the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Now, you might be saying, Chad, do you not like the United States? I love the United States of America. I love this nation. I've lived, I've lived in different countries in the world, and I've been to countries around the planet. And I'll tell you, there's, you know, the old saying, there's no place like, there really isn't. I appreciate this country. I appreciate um, those people have sought to keep it free historically. I, I appreciate that. But sadly, and I think most people can kind of see it today, this nation is really changing. I think, I'm guessing very few people would disagree with that. We are at a more divided time than I've ever seen it's in my lifetime, in my young 40-some years, but uh, we see this, that things are changing. Something is taking place, but we see that there's going to be persecution against God's people. That this nation is going to cause persecution here against people who faithfully follow the truth of the Word of God. 
Now, if you're willing to adapt to society and go along with what everybody else is doing, well, you'll have some mo a modicum of freedom, but in order to do that in the end of time, there will be the mark of the beast crisis, that we will have to receive the mark if we will not cling to Jesus, his word, and allow the God to inscribe something in our minds and hearts. And we'll be told, look, unless you follow the beast system, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. And that would be scary, wouldn't it? You know, for many years, I mean, you, you could imagine, well, if you had money saved up, you had cash or this or that or whatever, but we can see that the times we're living in, they could just shut off your bank account immediately. Yes or no? We can totally see that happening. And it is actually happening, not the mark of the beast crisis, but there are actually people, because they don't believe according to what certain businesses think people should believe, that they are literally shutting down people's access to finances and so forth. So this is not the mark of the beast yet, but it just gives us an idea of what could come ahead relatively soon. We can see that, yes or no? I, I know a man who is a, uh, actually owns a bank. Uh, they, his family had sold the business for $250 million, and they started a bank, and... and uh, I talked to him a few years back, and, and he has to really keep up on the legalities of banks and so forth, and he said that the things that he's seeing as a banker, as he's working with these governmental institutions in the, in the financial sector, he said what they are doing with the finances, he said to me it reminds him exactly of what he reads and what we're talking about in the book of Revelation as a banker. You can imagine how these things would take place. But when I think about all of this, when I think of the trials that God's people are going to go through in the last days, it makes me think of Jesus because Jesus is called the author and finisher of our what? Faith. Meaning Jesus gave us, he wrote down what our faith was to be like, and that we are also be a to be a people who have the faith of Jesus at the end time. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And Jesus is the author of our faith. He shares with us, with us what the faith is, and then he also lives within us so that we can live it out. But we can see Jesus went through actually almost exactly what we have to go through at the end of time. Listen to this. This is Jesus' experience. Number one, Jesus was brought before a secular government for his religious beliefs because his religious beliefs convicted them. God's people at the end of time are going to be brought before kings and rulers. Jesus told this in Matthew 24, yes or no? Yes, he did. He told us that. So he brought them before Jesus himself was brought before the same. So he's already been through that. So when you go through these trials, you can remember Jesus, he trod this path before me. Number two, the secular government, which was Pilate in this case, recognized Jesus' innocence, yet it condemned him because of mob opinion. Now, we can't imagine mob opinion trying to impact our judicial system in this country. We can't imagine that ever happening, can we? Yes, because we see those kind of things happening in the days we're living. But Jesus has already been there. They recognized his innocence, yet he, they got the government to condemn him because of what the mob was trying to force through. Number three, Jesus did the will of the Father regardless of public opinion and regardless of the persecution he would have to go through. Did he not? Yes, he did. Number four, in the midst of it all, he loved God with all his heart and he was faithful to God's word. You know, and did Jesus hate the people that were persecuting him? Can we hate the people who persecute us in the last days? God wants to make us like Jesus so that when we're persecuted, we say like Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Only God can help us to do something like that. Because naturally, if somebody were trying to kill you, we would naturally hate them, wouldn't we? We'd either simply fear them or hate them. 
but God says to pray for your enemies and those who spitefully use you and persecute you. But he doesn't ask us to do that, and he wasn't willing. He went through the very same thing. And Jesus, number five, stood up for his beliefs in a world of religious intolerance. And friends, Jesus can help us to do the same thing. As society becomes more and more religiously intolerant, help us be like Jesus so that we can stand up for him. And I don't mean stand up belligerently. I mean stand up lovingly for Jesus. Number six, he was willing to be different from family, friends, and the religion he grew up in. Is that true, yes or no? Yes, he was. We often think, oh, you know, my, my friends and family and church, it's all going to be okay. But the fact is, many times it will be those who are closest to us who will be the most likely to persecute us. We see that. Was it, was it a stranger who betrayed Jesus? It was one of his closest friends, his own disciple. Number seven, yet Jesus, as I already mentioned, it loved his enemies in the midst of it all. And friends, God is calling us to do the same. And friends, Jesus is coming soon. And I want to read to you, I want to close this message with a poem that I wrote some time ago. Kind of a strange title. It's called Barabbas, Lucifer, Me, or Jesus. Barabbas, Lucifer, Me, or Jesus. Murder and sedition were the crimes he'd done. Starting off with Barabbas. Murder and sedition were the crimes he'd done. From the multitude of Jews, admiration he'd won. Just like his father and his master too, but for the grace of God will go you. Peace was in heaven from eternity past. With Lucifer's deception, this sure did not last. A liar from the beginning and a murderer too. As from Jesus' side, his heart had withdrew. With jealousy and a heart full of pride, God's standard of love he had cast aside. He started a war in heaven above, separating from God's eternal love. One third of angels, of, of the angels, had made him their master, their choice the beginning of this great disaster. Then cast to the earth, they began to deceive, to encourage God's children to all disbelieve. To the Sadducees and the Pharisees too, he clouded their minds and spiritual view. They did not want to lose their position to the Nazarene who was the great physician. The applause of men more important just then than the spotless and humble Savior of men. Away with this man, they said of the Savior, his gift and life they sure did not savor. Give us Barabbas, they said with a cheer, for this murderer, sadly, they found him so dear. When we reject Jesus, we'll take anyone, from Hitler to Stalin or a man with a gun. Or maybe not them on our heart will enthrone. Maybe we'll worship one much closer to home. Our pride so great, we won't worship another, but maybe we'll worship one born of our mother. Could we turn from worshiping God to worshiping self? Yes, this truly is odd. Dust and ashes seek worship, but they are, were created. To do this were senseless, and logic's abated. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart the first command that he did impart. But when you see Jesus nailed to a tree, may all of your reason come back to thee. Forsaking self-worship, we turn to the cross. When turning to Jesus, we suffer no loss. But on the contrary, we gain truly all in everything that we had lost from the fall.
Friends, Jesus is coming. Amen. He is our Savior. There's many things, because this has been just a short seminar, we won't be able to go into everything just here, but these meetings, like we said, are going to continue on Sunday nights. And remember, the devil is going to be angry with a group of people at the end of time. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is the devil going to be angry with? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Jesus will give you strength to press through. He will give you strength if you are willing to cling to the robe of his righteousness. He will actually cover you, but he will fill you also. Is it your desire to say, Jesus, I need the strength to cling to you because I can't even do that on my own. I need your strength. Is that your desire this evening? Let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you just now. Lord, we recognize we can't make it in the times that we're living in. We can't make it at the end of time on our own strength. And if we think we can, we're the most likely to fall. Peter was so sure, oh, I can do it. I will never turn away from you. No way. Somebody else might, but I never will. Father, help us not have that spirit. Rather, help us to have the heart that says, Father, you know my heart is prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. I give it to you, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Just now, while all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, maybe there's someone here this evening who you sense that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. That you sense that Jesus is calling to you to commit your life to him. Maybe even, maybe there is someone here even who has decided, some have already decided to prepare for baptism. Maybe there's someone here this evening, the Holy Spirit is impressing your heart and you want to say, Jesus, I want to yield my life to you and I, I want to begin to prepare for baptism. Is there one person who by... While all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, is there one person here who says, I I want to begin to prepare for baptism? Would you raise your hand where you are just now? Raise your hand. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Is there one more person who wants to raise their hand and say, I would like to prepare for baptism? Would you raise your hand just now? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless my brother who has raised his hand, that you would guide, that you would strengthen as that preparation is made to go into a deeper connection with you. Lord, I pray that day by day we would walk with you. And Lord, we know that you will fill us with your spirit if we will yield our hearts to you. Not because we're good, but because you are good, and that's your desire is to fill us with your holiness. We ask that you would day by day guide each one of us. And as we go into our our next meeting on Saturday, we pray that you would divinely bless in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to let you know Saturday is going to be at 11 a.m. And our message then is entitled, How to Get and Stay Undeceived. And then we're going to have, and by the way, then there's a meal afterward that we want to invite you out to. You don't have to bring it. Just come out, come out make sure you come. And, um, and if you have to go, that's fine too. But if you want, if you're like me, or you're like uh, many guys, we appreciate when there's food around. And so, uh, you know, you'd want to come to that. But uh, Charles, when, are we going to do it? Is it going to be same time on Sunday night? 7 o'clock Sunday night. We're going to meet together. We're going to go deeper into a set of Bible studies. What is the name of the Bible study guide series? Prophecy of Hope, where you're going to get a a printed out, obviously you're getting handouts at these meetings, just kind of normal printed paper, but you're going to get an actual, uh, a printed Bible study guide each time, where point by point, it's going to deepen some of the understanding of some of the things that we've went through, but it's going to go deeper into things like you're going to, like I said, learn about the mark of the beast, deadly demonic deceptions of what happened after death, Uh, you know, these kind of things, death, near death, and life after death delving into some powerful information. So that's going to be Sunday night, so you don't want to miss that. 
uh, come on back. I'll, I'll be here and this Sunday with you, and uh, we're going to study together, and hope to see you Saturday morning at 11. God bless, and have a fantastic day. Night. <laughs>